Hello, my name is Alfredo. Welcome to my piano space time. This is my study discussion on Debussy's Cloche à travers le feuille from the second group of images. You can find on YouTube my performance of this piece at the link that I posted in the description notes here under. Before starting presenting my thoughts on this music, uh, let's play a few lines. Before entering into the details of the technical and musical issues to work on, uh, let me say a few general considerations about this work. Uh, I believe this piece is exceptionally rich in uh, musical and artistic terms, and from the specific viewpoint of the performer, uh, this translates in a variety of um, technical uh, styles uh, textures or choreographies uh, that are very diverse along the seven pages of music. And, um, however, in my opinion, there are two dominant aspects to be uh, kept in mind while uh, working on this music score. And I would say that, incidentally, both of them are quite elusive, ambiguous, in strict pianistic terms. And the first one is playing the piano, meant as playing uh, softly, gently at the piano. And the second is playing legato. Uh, when we go into the details, I'll try to be uh, more specific, to articulate uh, what I mean regarding uh, these two aspects that, once again, I define elusive and ambiguous in terms of uh, pianistical technique. There is also, I think, a third aspect that is in a way uh, related to the first one, to playing piano. This third aspect is to highlight, to underline a specific melodic line uh, along a polyphonic texture, or to highlight highlight uh, specific notes uh, across that texture. Um, so I think uh, these are uh, subtle and, and yet crucial um, element that we should keep in mind, I believe, since the very first moment of opening the score and starting in working on it to build up our uh, playing the choreography uh, to develop our um, capability to, to express the musical ideas working on the requirements of the, the keyboard and of the notes. Uh, one other uh, general consideration um, is for me to underline the fact that the music score is very rich of details that I am quite sure come directly from Debussy. We find plenty of notes regarding expressivity, uh, plenty of uh, agogic indications, so uh, suggesting you how to regulate the speed, uh, the accelerations or the um, deceleration in the music. There are, of course, a great number of dynamic indications, so piano, pianissimo, forte. Clearly, we notice that the large majority of the piece is basically on the level of piano and pianissimo. And uh, this on one side 
is an additional challenge, in particular if you want to memorize the work and you are proposing yourself to perform in a faithful, faithful way uh, with the entirety of the indications that Debussy wanted to, to leave for us on the, uh, on the paper. Uh, on the other end, I think that this richness of indications is a facilitation for us because uh, several times when I kind of uh, went back with my attention to, to look at them, I felt like I was given an additional turn uh, on the key to open the door and enter uh, the magic world of Debussy's uh, harmonic and uh, musical ideas. One, one more thing, uh, for my discussion, uh, for reasons of good order and, and convenience of exposition, I will start from measure one and I will go on until the end of the piece. But I believe that this is not at all the best way to study a piece of music, and certainly a piece of music of this difficulty. Uh, instead, I think the best thing would be to start picking up one of those points here and there that appears uh, appear more scary to you in terms of uh, performing difficulties. Certainly these points will require more time for you to work and to master them. And instead, the rest of musical sections will more easily uh, grow up in your familiarity to handle them while you are investing more time on the problematic parts. This being said, let's start with uh, the first two measures with the detailed discussion. So here we see already uh, what I highlighted in terms of richness of details. So let's have a look precisely. We are at the beginning, we have an indication about the speed, uh, length, so slow. In my edition, there is also a metronomic indication, 92 for a, um, for a quaver. Then we start with the PP, pianissimo. We see two accent marks, two different accent marks that we find along the piece several times and in general in Debussy uh, music scores. Then in my edition I have una corda pedal uh, required here. I'm not sure if this, come, if this comes from Debussy or not. And I have also a pedal mark that will start from the very first note and will keep going for um, a total of five measures here. We have a slur, staccato marks, and uh, last we have an expressivity note, doucement sonore, uh, I guess in English something like sweetly sonorous, something like that. I find uh, many times very effective to work on music scores applying the technique of outlining. This is not my own idea, it's something I read about in uh, a very interesting book for me uh, that is Abby White Size on Piano Playing. And you will find uh, um, Abby uh, explaining and introducing in, in rich detail the rationale the foundation of this idea of approaching a, a music line that I believe in many cases, like in these cases, are very effective. What's outlining? Outlining is to remove notes to start familiarizing with, uh, with a segment of music and which notes? The secondary ones. Now, how to find the, the secondary notes? Well, in the large majority of cases, it's quite simple. You start playing just the, the notes on the main beat of the, of the line, and this is typically a, a very good guess. So in here, uh, supposing we are at the very be beginning, rather than taking care about doing everything, that would be... Uh, 
let's outline uh, the nodes that represent the, how to say, let's say pillars of the bass rhythm of the music. So, And uh, this is, I believe, of great help for our body to start, you know, settling in the choreography, literally, that you have to, to, to express, to, to, to perform, to translate uh, in music uh, this technical thing that is handling with, with an instrument. And this now, um, give us the opportunity to, to work on the differentiation of these two different accent marks that we find in this brief line. So the first uh, accent mark, the wedge, so is a, a more energetic, kind of sharper um, and quicker uh, strike on the key, uh, I think uh, can be uh, effectively taken with uh, uh, your arm supporting the, the finger muscle and then we have at the, in the middle of the measure the flat accent that suggests to me to reduce the action of the uh, big muscle in the arm and instead kind of uh, more deeply grasping that C trying to I like that with respect to the other quavers. So once again, and I know that the microphone of my camera here uh, do not have a good dynamic capability, so unfortunately this will come out flattened, but consider in your study that um, we have to, to, to concentrate in differentiating the action, even in physical terms, that corresponds to, the, to these two different accent marks. So. And we can repeat this two or three times and then we'll start adding a few notes here and there. Another uh, consideration on these few notes. So we have this lure and the staccato signs. To me, it sounds plausible that uh, these staccato notes rather than being performed with a sort of finger jumps like Instead, are more to be taken by a kind of uh, a careful pressure, like you try to gently and deeply take these notes with the finger, and these also create what sounds to me something like the indication "dulcimer sonore" uh, wants you to, uh, to to perform. So once again, um, arm action on the first accent, a kind of uh, more assertive touch on the in the middle of the measure. So. And a deep sweet pressure on the secondary notes. Well, in a way, I think that these concepts I introduced are what we need to work on on the 90% of the work, but I don't want to be so hermetic, so I will enjoy 
commenting the rest of measures in detail, but uh, I will take again um, these basic ideas in several times that are what we need to, to keep in mind to work here. Uh, I said at the beginning in the general thoughts about um, one dominant aspect that is playing piano, playing it gently. And I said this being elusive, ambiguous. And I believe this, yes, it's, it's really very true. It's kind of uh, one of the main technical issues that we have to work on in, in our experience of uh, performing with this instrument. Um, in fact, you know, this very same piano in the small room where I am, basically, in a way, uh, is playing loud with uh, whatever intensity of touch I am, I am using. And, of course, if, if I increase the energy and the number of notes, this loudness will uh, increase uh, quite, quite a lot. But the same instrument, uh, if it is placed in a music hall, instead will immediately become a kind of a weaker um, musical instrument, in particular this old piano that has not the energy of certain modern instruments. And this is quite tricky. And in my personal experience uh, over the years, uh, even the, the, the piano teachers unconsciously at time uh, become kind of misleading in uh, commenting what you are doing on the keys in terms of what to do with, with a piano line. Once again, this is a very elusive thing. So I, I don't pretend in few minutes here to, to, to solve the issue. It is something that probably uh, will go on with the life of, of a pianist uh, kind of uh, <laughs> forever in a way of saying. Um, but another two hints, I think, uh, can help us to navigate through this particular and very important aspect. Uh, for example, I was hearing not long time ago in a documentary about the super great pianist Arturo Benedetti Michelangeli. Uh, there was in the documentary a brief section where um, they were interviewing uh, uh, a lady that was one of his pupils in younger age. And one of the interesting comments she was saying was that uh, Michelangeli was kind of insisting with uh, his pupils um, on the fact that uh, even in the piano, even in the pianissimo, uh, the touch of the pianist has to be, she was saying the term, straight. And I believe this is very important to, to meditate on uh, because the, the piano uh, has a range in terms of energy that is delivered to the, uh, to the strings, uh, a range of energies within which it expresses uh, its, uh, how to say, a potential beauty, a sound beauty. And when you cross the boundaries of the, of the range, either because you are playing too loud or because you are not delivering enough energy on the string, there is a kind of either distortion on the louder end or, how uh, to say, uh, paling, pay affecting the sound. And once again, if you are in a small room, perhaps these boundaries on the piano side tends to enlarge a little bit, but then in a larger hole, uh, it is more easily that that side where sounds tend to be pale uh, really loses, how to say, um, beauty and even um, capability of delivering uh, a few notes, those few notes to, uh, to the public that is listening to you. So once again, this idea of the straight touch of even the pianissimo uh, working to have a sort of uh, assertiveness in the action. And so in this 
piece that is in the large majority carrying the mark of pian and pianissimo. This is a thing always to keep in mind. Otherwise, the risk, I believe, is very easy to uh, inadvertently start to producing pale sounds that will not help to, uh, to develop, to establish the, the sound the beauty of this, of this work. So let's move on with bars, uh, with measures three and four. Here I think uh, this point gives the opportunity to me to underline the, I believe, rhythmical uh, character of this work uh, that is also in a way, I think, uh, coherent with the evocative title of the work. So when we put all together progressively the notes in these two measures, I would start again with the highlighting to feel clearly that we have a very solid rhythmical um, flow underneath all these little notes. Uh, let's hear that in practice. So with the outlining, we start adding a few notes here and there, but we settle down in this rhythmical flow that is, I believe, very characteristic. Here, one thing to work on is the fingering. You see uh, my suggested indications. Um, so in the edition I have in particular in the second quarter in the right hand, there is a fingering that I didn't find at all comfortable for me. Especially here at the beginning of the piece. So I prefer to solve that point uh, in this way. hear it. Let's fill up. And while working on this, I think an important thing is to monitor your touch in the right hand, at least in this piano, the, the acute keys tends to become a little weaker. So, um, in general, having the care, the attention, hearing whether your touch is sufficient to express what is written here a little um, highlighted on the top, right? Without missing that rhythmic pattern of the bells, that we played right before removing the secondary notes. In a way, I feel it is effective to say here we have to work quite a bit with our touch. That means with the finger grasping possibilities, natural grasping capabilities. Uh, to make sure that one note after the other is conveying that legato line, that means uh, sound energy continuity. And going back to the playing the piano elusive thing, well, uh, in a way, uh, I feel I'm not quite playing really piano those notes, and I'm not playing really piano those accents here. I think 
with the instrument is what I need to do to have the nice sound that it can give to me. And instead, the secondary note that are the semi quavers. In this case, the one that can be played a little bit on the surface of the keys, so without the concern of reaching um, neatly uh, the key bed under that. Uh, this I would do certainly when I practice them, so a few uh, repetitions like of the uh, pattern of the nose, this can be helpful, but then again outlining uh, to concentrate with the touch control in deep turns on the important notes and leave the rest instead a little bit more on the surface, really to leading the hearing attention on what Debussy wrote uh, to be highlighted, the melody and the accent. this not quite natural fingering that in a way is obliged in my opinion is effective when I study to kind of be generous in the in the movement even in the disconnection kind of enlarge your comfort zone and using that, especially if you play slow, um, not to tighten your physical action there and not to, uh, how to say, um, restrict uh, the expressivity of the line. So once again... A few times again going back to the outlining and progressive feeling to do things um, at tempo. six and let's see a few things about that. At bar five we have this left hand with a sort of kids playing. I mean to say you see that the fourth and fifth finger are just jumping over uh, these second intervals like is doing nothing particularly complicated. Uh, well, once again, outlining I think is a good way to familiarize with this. Even to uh, express that crescendo, so kind of focus on the starting points and the arrival points, and similarly with the left hand, the starting point that is a piano or a pianissimo and gradually increasing intensity. So let's outline keeping in mind that there is a crescendo and a diminuendo. bar 
R6 with uh, Appianissimo. Here I want to underline the bells in the tenor and in, in the contralto. So. can conveniently hold physically the G. If your hand is large enough to take this notes with the one, it's a possibility or simply doing like Notice the accuracy of the indication, there is a um, decelerating here at the end, so... And once again, outlining helps us to kind of shift our attention on the crucial musical details. Here at measure seven, what we in a way uh, found at measure three, so it's a variant of that main line. And I want here to underline that second general consideration regarding playing legato. Already at measure three, we come across that, but I, I didn't in my words highlight that. So the right hand is required to play a legato line that is. Clearly, it's impossible a physical legato. Let's not be concerned about that, but rather let's be careful in the intensity of the notes, in the fluidity of the choreography. And notice here once again the uh, neat rhythmical character of the music with the left hand that is starting this uh, accompaniment with a rhythmic figure. Here in my edition the pedal is uh, interrupted in the middle of the measure, I think uh, uh, it's necessary. And uh, for the rest is something similar to measure three, but we notice that we have a slightly heavier action, so we have, while studying, calibrate our touch, especially with the right hand, um, so that we underline that line over an overall pianissimo indication, as the Pussy is writing. So, once again, a bit more assertive in the soprano. And instead, staying a bit on the surface, playing with the grasping capability and modulating in not transferring the weight of the arm on the semi-quavers, so that the soprano actually stay highlighted. And the left end, uh, just um, a very light rhythmical pattern. Notice that here we don't have that accent in the bass that we had at measure 3 and 4. So these are tiny differences that I believe are very important in the musical message. We have reached measure 9 and 10, so we have some new musical material here. Uh, once again, outlining here as in, I think, each of the measures of this work is a great way to uh, build up our choreography and uh, uh, becoming confident with the texture we have to perform.
here we have a couple of tricky points the second and the fourth quaver of major nine where we jump with the hands to a relatively far position so we i need to practice that a number of times to become solid and confident Here we have an indication, nearly nothing for the left hand in this figure. I think a practical way is first to start with some fingers that you feel you are very comfortable with to explore the possibility of the action in terms of this nearly nothing. So for instance, with my right hand, I take the second finger and I explore what I can really do as nearly nothing without losing the sound at all and without entering into something that is more than nearly nothing. So now I get the sound idea, I try to work on that with my weak finger that has to be used here. of measures 9 and 10 uh, so we have again to practice that jump with a different harmony here between the end of measure 11 and the beginning of the 12th and here as in measures 9 and 10 I think I didn't say that practicing even in chord is helpful I believe not alone sufficient for me but is a good helpful step and even keep adding the lines quite assertively instead outline outlining we start paying attention to the real uh, important thing, the bearing points of the musical message. In particular, notice the accents that are uh, uh, the bells that come in the picture in the second half of measure 12. So I outline from the measure before and let's start playing that accents in the choreography. Once we are familiar with these base pillars of the musical flow, we fill up here and there, and as long as we, de we develop confidence, we increase the number of notes. We have reached major 13. So uh, we are in front of this relatively long section from major 13 to major 20 uh, that is, I believe, a truly impressionistic uh, segment. Let's hear it and uh, let's then go on with some considerations.
Now here we have this task of uh, evoking uh, those sensations that we feel when looking at the sunlight uh, passing through trembling leaves. Uh, I believe this is really what uh, we, are, we have to try to, to express. And uh, uh, in fact, we have a, an important note here from Debussy when uh, the, this pattern that is split between the two hands starts that says very equal like an iridescent mist. Uh, we have another note that is uh, in tempo. So now the exercise is to uh, create uh, this, this emotional feeling uh, by controlling our muscles and bone system through the key and action system that eventually leads to uh, the percussion uh, of strings by means of uh, felt hammers. So uh, let's get into bites this elephant that we have to eat. So Debussy uh, is giving a good hint, I believe, with the first part of his note, very even, very equal. And remember, he's saying in tempo. Now, uh, the first necessary thing uh, to be very equal in such a pattern is to establish a very neat and precise rhythmical line. Uh, rhythm is not really uh, coming out from the totality of the complication of all the notes we have in a measure, but is uh, mostly uh, borne by um, the, uh, the main beats of these patterns. That very simply here uh, are uh, the first notes of each group of five, uh, five notes in the, in the measures. So uh, let's start practicing our evenness the equality we can play by simply playing the first note of these groups. And we might even try first with the finger by which we feel more comfortable to feel, to explore what is the limit that the action and the instrument we have is giving in terms of playing pianissimo. So let's do this simple exercise like to set uh, a basic target. And remember, we should recover that tempo that we used to start at the very beginning, so... first element of, uh, of my aura image, I will work on it with the actual hand and finger that I need to use. And so uh, I will use the first finger for me with my left hand. And one more consideration here, I would say, it feels for me terribly difficult to restrict the action for these uh, quick notes to the finger action to the point that I believe is, at least for me, for this instrument, is not the proper way. Instead, uh, I will remember that I have an entire uh, biological mechanism available, and in particular for the base pillars of my rhythmical flow, I will certainly take advantage of my entire arm for the action of the first notes of the group. So let's do that. Kinesthetic capabilities, the sound result, and uh, converge through little adjustment to that level of pianissimo and regularity that I want to play. Uh, once I have gained my confidence on this simple basic exercise, I can start adding a few notes. And I believe a good idea is to add the other three notes in the right hand. So now playing four notes out of these five, but trying to maintain their position in the 
uh, in the group of the five. I feel that my wrist and hand tends naturally to kind of lift toward the last two notes of the three that the right hand takes. I feel that I shouldn't neither restrict this nor to exaggerate this, but actually feel it and in a way take advantage about what it helps to do. That means a more intimate feeling and control of those quick notes I have to play. And then, as a last step, I can add the least important note here, that is the second of the group of five that I will mm, take with my fourth finger. This is my choice. You might feel better to use perhaps your third finger or whatever else you find convenient. right hand change their patterns so I will do the same process with these new notes and nothing new to be said. Now uh, Debussy left other uh, very uh, precious indications for our um, way towards expressing the musical uh, beauty of this section and so uh, one is regarding the long notes in the right hand so I guess the bells sound. So we have an indication here on the first two notes, expressive and sweetly emphatic, right? And I notice that we have two flat accents here at bar for uh, 15. No, excuse me, that probably is bar uh, 14. And then all the other long notes do not have any accent until we reach bar 19, I believe, on this E and B flat. Here, once again, the C marked this flat accent. So to me, this discontinuity of indications means that most probably, I would say clearly, he didn't want that we uh, apply the same accent on the other notes where he didn't write anything, right? And so what does it mean for me as a, a keyboard player? Well, I feel uh, the C sharp and the D should be played with a uh, very good combination of finger grasping action and a bit of the weight of my arm, right? So I use a bit of the weight of my arm on those notes, trying then to release it uh, when I play the uh, 30 seconds note in the right hand. Instead, going ahead, I don't have any more the accents, so I can reduce the weight action for the long note and limiting um, to my grasping action, uh, I think is quite convenient and effective. So once again, grasping and weight. issues to work on. Uh, one is uh, those jumps, those little transitions that for me needs uh, a kind of focused uh, practice in there. 
So at bar 18, where I have to jump from the B flat to the C and G uh, uh, chord here. And I believe there is nothing else then to be done uh, than practicing several times this jump here. increasing the, the, the speed in grasping those two notes while we gain a confidence with the distance. Other important elements are these crescendo and diminuendo indications and simply once again the same tools to me are what I need to work on. So I remove notes and I try to express the crescendo with those basic rhythm notes. that at bar 18, 19 and 20 these five notes groups uh, includes one uh, interval, harmonic interval. of the process is to play those uh, initial notes in the groups as a chord. Just to get kind of um, familiarized and confident on uh, the keys that shall be taken when you play these melodically. Uh, what else to say for this section? Oh, right, that issue of playing legato. Clearly, we have here a nice clear example, considering that the right hand has to sing these long notes, but basically with any possibility of physical connection between keys. and. Uh, this doesn't belong to the pianistic, uh, how to say, realm of possibility. So we have to focus on the sound continuity and uh, fluidity and elasticity of our movements. And actually also for the speed that things happen here, for example, there are notes like uh, very clearly at bar 19, the B and G flat, that only can be grasped very quickly with actually a staccato, but thanks to the pedal and with the tension of the sound intensity, 
we can express that legato that Debussy wants. go on and uh, we are again with the indication on tempo at bar 21 where we have a sort of pattern very similar uh, to what we found in the first bars of the piece. So we have the uh, right hand with the fifth finger that has to lead with a melody with uh, flat accents. <laughs> Again, we have a legato task to be played with just one finger and the fifth finger on one, two, three, four, five, six notes. And the pedal and our fluidity in the movements should be the key. And uh, here we have a little trick in the left hand that has to take part of the secondary notes in the decoration, the semi quavers in the top. Uh, stuff. So we have kind of familiarizing in giving a bit more importance to the quavers line and just picking up kind of by mistake in our way of saying those semi quavers that would be problematic for the right hand to take. So something like <laughs> again uh, I think a useful trick for me at least is to play uh, very quickly very briefly the semi quavers belonging to the six um, notes in the decoration figure on the top so first step to play them quickly and then is refinement or trying to reduce the energy on those keys with respect to what you are doing with the quavers notes of this line that is basically what we met at the beginning. And we notice that at bar 23 we have a kind of repetition of what we just played with some variation and Debussy is not writing any longer the flat accent on the top notes and this is for me very interesting and musically I believe very valuable, very delicate. So reducing uh, the importance of those leading notes in the top, we naturally have uh, that that line of quavers in the left hand gains importance and tends to um, to arise to the attention of the of the listener. because we notice that these quavers notes uh, gains in their importance progressively because they will lead to what will be what I would call the compass notes in the next section. What I mean to say is that so we have um, removed energy from the right hand and we have this, this line uh, taking some importance and then with the crescendo that line increases his presence in, in, the, in the musical line, anticipating uh, that uh, assertive um, singing of the A and G at bar 25. Yes, we 
reached uh, major 25. So here our choreography work needs to be a bit more complicated, but I think that all the tools that we have uh, worked on so far are what we need to, uh, to prepare our performance on these measures. And so I, I repeat again the idea that for me is useful to identify in this complication of notes here uh, my compass notes that to me musically are clearly alone to make them clear. These finos give to me the kind of um, compass, uh, the reference to maintain my balance while I fill up with the other notes that are uh, mostly decorative. So even in the left end I have this chord, but the top notes marked with a flat accent are clearly dominant, while the notes in the bottom should be played with a bit of um, shift of energy that is, is instead taken by the thumb on the top note of the chord. Part 20, uh, 26, we have this arpeggio. Yes, we have to practice, to practice it a bit slowly, taking uh, well the keys. But in performance, the attention is just for the top notes, so these other notes are kind of quickly taken along the way. Depending on your hand, you might want to try to hold them or not holding them. It really depends on how comfortable and relaxed is your hand. But you have the build out there, so there is not a big difference. And I think when I play, probably I, I leave the fifth finger and instead I can easily keep down physically uh, the B, the C and the E before touching the A and the G. So again, outlining, we can start with the bass rhythm notes in the right hand. A bit more feeling. By the way, I believe that bar 25 deserves a bit more of energy. In my edition, there is a suggestion of playing with all three strings, bar 25, and then bar 26 to go with una corda. So that bar 25 is a bit more assertive and bar 26 a kind of echo. And I think there is a very important detail that is the flat accent that Debussy wrote uh, in the middle of these uh, semi-quivers groups of six notes and uh, with the pedal down there is a beautiful effect of uh, bells sounding there. So. Thinking to play this little nose with the flat accent alone, as I did, is uh, quite complicated, right? But actually, uh, playing them like a landing point of the quick semiquavers right before becomes quite natural after we practice it for a while. And so at the very end, we have just to keep in mind that there is this to be done. And when we practice those groups of semiquavers, I think we might split them and stopping on the accent nose for a few times 
it later to fill up with the rest that is light, uh, um, a very near ornament. What I mean to say is that if we play like this, it will feel very ergonomic, very natural to arrive with a sort of accent on the thumb that takes those accented notes. Okay, I'm exaggerating this, but through the process you can start with that and then refining the touch and the energy up to that right level that you want to be on. Regarding the semi-quavers, a bit of practice with the key bedding of the keys to get familiarity with the patterns. even perhaps in chords. Without anxiety to keep too long uh, to make a physical legato that doesn't have um, any meaning considering that we have the, uh, the pedal down. So just release those long notes, I believe, when you feel that it is natural and uh, helping the fluidity doing that. And uh, uh, after we have practiced with these little details, I think very important to take instead again the main beats to uh, settle in the main points of our uh, large, long lines choreography. So, and also here, uh, to be brave enough to uh, zoom in those critical jumps and practice really a few notes before and after on that point, for example, at the end of bar 26. Or here at the beginning of bar 27. We have reached bar 27, right? And here the left hand again have compass notes. Let's practice first these important notes that are both at the leading line in the aural image, but can be also physically a point of uh, balancing in the complexity of the choreography in this part. What we have to do is pedal in the first jump and notice that um, the right hand bells in the top are synchronous with the ternary rhythm here at the beginning then in the middle of the bar is slightly more complicated in the sense that the left hand swap to a binary rhythm and instead the bells in the top of the right and the figure is still ternary and so it's uh, an easy thing however to work on in the sense that Again, we have leading compass notes that are this bed in the left end. I would play first those notes with the main notes in the right end. 
even removing the grace notes that complicates a bit things when we start practicing. And for me, it's quite natural, convenient to use an action of keep keys pushing rather than hand dropping. So. And to move towards the final performance with the grace note, first in chords. And then splitting the grace note from the other two notes with uh, making it as easy as possible. problematic, so focusing there, restricting our attention and practice is, for me, necessary. We have reached bar 30. Once again, I think that the large majority of considerations to work on whatever will come later in this piece has been already presented. Uh, so, in a way, if you want to go through this last part, you will find some example of applying once again those concepts, and then I will highlight the details here and there uh, that I think are very important not to be missed. Uh, before starting showing uh, my ideas regarding how to work on bar 30 and 31, uh, just a remark. If you have listened to uh, my performance in the video of this piece, perhaps you have noticed that I am playing uh, the chords at bar uh, 30 and 31 in a slightly different way than what the notation that I find in my edition, but I think you will find in most of editions is shown. Basically, I am uh, doing a sort of full arpeggio, using then the left hand to play the top notes, like this. Once again, this is not the way it is written in my edition, that is instead something like... played it slowly, first of all, because I never studied it in this way, but also to show clearly what is the layout of the arpeggios in the way it is written. I think it would be probably boring for you to hear the detail about my choice. You are free to, uh, to appreciate it or to reject it. Of course, I, I wouldn't probably do that if I need to play this work in a uh, music examination at the conservatory or music school or in a competition because this kind of license easily uh, derate your overall performance uh, by themselves. Uh, in my opinion, however, uh, there are uh, valid reasons to do that. Once again, you might uh, feel to, to do that or just stick with the original. However, what I will now show in my discussion is based on uh, the performance choice I made, but the same way of working is applicable if you play the chords in that way that are written and I showed before. Now, needless to say, in these two bars, 30 and 31, uh, these chords playing with arpeggios are the uh, leading line in the music material. So, uh, first thing first, uh, I believe we have first to, to practice them removing the um, decorative notes, the, uh, the quavers, 
and uh, even before then moving to the complete choreography of the arpeggios, uh, we have kind of settled with our uh, playing biological mechanism in that rather intricate layout of this chord. And what does this mean? Is let's try to show it in practice. So. taking slowly uh, each note and this is to make sure to to feel where my muscles my articulations are kind of um, feeling certain little tensions or discomfort so that gradually uh, with the focus and attention I try to apply those minimal micromedical adjustment in my action to reduce those discomfortities until uh, playing with confidence the entire number of notes that are quite a bit in these chords in this dynamic way. to play the course in this continuous way that I, I have chosen, um, pay attention not to hit the top notes with the entire structure of your bones in the arm, otherwise those notes will become quite uh, um, uh, too, too hard. And in fact, we have to notice that there is no accent marks of any kind um, on the top of those notes. So, in our study, we have to pay attention to reach with sufficient, um, how to say, um, in a sufficiently soft way, those notes. And I believe that uh, the point is to take advantage of the grasping capability of the finger that should kind of lead in that moment the touch on that top note rather than hitting with the entire energy, the kinetic energy that your arm, hand and finger has gained in the quick movement. So. second half of each bar and of course this is translated in a little different difference in the energy that the top notes are played in the last two quarters but mostly I think that crescendo will be taken by the decorative notes that since are uh, filling uh, the flow are more in charge to establish that, um, that sense of gradual crescendo. Once again and uh, after that we feel confident with the rhythm, with the control, it will take a while, I guess, uh, we can start then working on the uh, decorative part that, however, uh, is, has his uh, great importance. For example, to realize that crescendo, but also to maintain that uh, rhythmical uh, flow in, in uh, shorter terms that 
and the piece is, is carried until this point and we keep going. So first let's isolate this decoration that is something like and once we are familiar with the layout and uh, I suggest to insert partially some of these notes in the overall choreography. So something like practicing is uh, the jump between those notes we have reached to uh, the first chord of bar 32. So. And it's for me a rather difficult moment and uh, taking the first chord of bar 32 I feel that it could be an effective idea to practice synchronizing the top three note of the six that the left hand has to take with the right hand chord. So the left hand has to do... So I could practice first like... the jump from bar 31. And now let's zoom in in bars 32 and 33. Uh, first of all, the first chord is marked forte, not fortissimo. And, uh, we have to pay attention because we have so many notes and we arrive uh, dynamically on that that this requires a bit of work uh, to be respected, right? And uh, then we have the only mark fortissimo of the entire piece at the very end of bar 31. <laughs> choose to believe whether it is maybe uh, something that Debussy forgot or the editor of my edition forgot to mark, but I prefer to think that that was intentional, also considering that there is so high accuracy in the detailed notes and marks in the piece, all in all. So this detail is that um, at Bach 32 uh, we have this chord marked forte without any other marks except the right hand top note that has that strong wedge accent and even with a flat accent. I'm not sure about what it means precisely, but it is like that. So there's something like... Instead, after those fortissimo... At bar 33, we go again to forte, so the fortissimo energy is released, but notice that in the left end we have a staccato dot and an accent wedge. And uh, does it mean something? I like to think yes, and uh, it sounds to me like a suggestion for our choreography in the sense that when we are at bar 32, <laughs> without accent, I feel the hand should have better stay there, uh, a kind of smoother hit stroke on the keys and the energy is not that much to, to bounce up again. Instead, at bar 33, that staccato mark with the wedge accent, so the very energy accent, suggests to me uh, a choreography like uh, that is also physically helpful. 
helpful to express that accent on the D. And we notice that at part of the tree we don't have the wedge accent on the G that we found instead of bar 32. So it's like Debussy wants really that D to be the bell that prevail with the rest 40. And so why not striking with that nice choreographic flying on it? And one more detail is at uh, bar 32, we have uh, together with the fortissimo notes in the left hand that I find convenient to play by uh, energetic pushing. We have the left, uh, sorry, the right hand marked with pianissimo. A very interesting, right? With a hand, a fortissimo um, energetic movement and a pianissimo with those little notes in the soprano. And I think this is actually a kind of facilitating the situation once you practice a little bit, because uh, you might realize that at times when there are many notes and we want to, how to say, uh, to inject high energy in all of them, it becomes uh, quite difficult and heavy and perhaps even uh, not really musical to do that. Instead, even in fortissimo, this is an example where it is not necessarily true uh, that all the notes in the segment have to take all that energy. And let's go back to the uh, simple good principles that I ex explained in the uh, previous sections. So let's um, outline uh, the main notes and progressively we fill up to uh, develop the entire uh, choreography of these bars. are again those same compass notes that we found at bar 25, do you remember? Except they are in the uh, higher octave. important element that is the profound bell in the bass. It's marked pianissimo but we have a flat accent and that's, that's I believe really an important uh, bass pillar in the musical material of these bars. <laughs> at the end of bar 34 and at the end of bar uh, 35, they do not carry the staccato mark that we were finding at bar 25 and 26. In bar 25 and 26 we have the staccato with this lure, so something like... We have to play like shifting our weight from the how to call the B chords of each quaver, like rather than as before. And 
the fortress we have set already all the teams. So outlining, first uh, playing the notes in the main beats and progressively filling up. So we are at bar 36. Uh, for myself, bar 36 could be a good point uh, uh, to start working on the uh, actual study and detailing of things. Perhaps after you have read, you know, we are in another, uh, the totality of the score. I feel bar 36 is probably at the peak of the difficulties of this work. But actually, the things that we have discussed so far are the tools that we need to use to, to work on that. I would highlight particularly the situation in the left end where we have this chord. And similarly, bar 28 and 39. The task is that I believe clearly the thumb has the role to uh, to lead the music. That's the singing line. So these chords are not simply a bunch of notes with equal importance, but eventually what we have to work to uh, to to highlight is. two points that you have to, to work on. First, the grasping capability of the thumb. And just let me highlight that the thumb has a particular uh, physiology with respect to the other fingers, because I can, with the other fingers, of course, naturally do a very large movement vertically, right? This is what they naturally can do. But the thumb doesn't have the same capability. You, you have noticed, right? So if I want to go downward, I, I don't have that easy possibility in my muscles. Instead, what the, the thumb is good in doing is something like that, okay? And so we have, in a way, to be aware of this when we work in our micro-movements, not to start driving against the flow because that won't lead us to any place good. So um, the thumb here have uh, this, this requirement in using his grasping possibility in the most natural way as possible to highlight the top notes in the chords. But then the other tool is to try to play with the balance of weight of our arm and hand uh, trying to kind of shift that in the top notes of this course. And it's something that really we have to feel and to work by feeling rather than reasoning and, and thinking. Um, so that leading line is uh, the, 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 uh, the main character in, in the bars. But we have another very important thing that are the profound bells in the bass, again, as in the previous bar. And here those bells do not only uh, create uh, the, the, the resonance, the harmony, but it gives also the very important fundamental uh, bass rhythm in long terms. So let's practice that alone. And notice that the BC mark them pianissimo but with a flat accent. After we have uh, started building up the, the chord sequence, and perhaps without using the pedal, it might be a good idea to start with uh, 
then we should start practicing that um, not really typical and natural use of the pedal, at least as it is marked in my edition, but I think it is, makes a lot of sense. So we have the pedal change on the uh, quaver before uh, the second important bit in the, in the major, right? And uh, once again, it's not something probably very natural. So I, was, I would start from the very beginning when we start assembling these notes to familiarize with that. And notice that at part 35 and 37, um, we have uh, a piano mark, expressive and highlighted. At part 38, we have a, a more piano, più piano. And my editor here, I think, uh, gives a good suggestion to stay with all strings at part 36 and uh, going with uh, una corda at part 38. So let's practice a bit. Uh, the, the musical texture is so complicated that I wouldn't jump to bar 38 like that. That would be a process later on when each bars in this page are kind of solid and familiar with you, then starting working on the long line. It's an important step, of course. And uh, being, uh, there is nothing else probably to be said rather than repeating what I already said uh, several times for the previous sections. So let's outline for a while to show the process and then we can go ahead. regarding this technique of outlining, so removing notes and then progressively filling them up uh, after starting with the base uh, points of the musical line. Uh, so once you start filling up a few additional notes, uh, you might come across points where there is, uh, you know, some difficulties, lack of control. And as long as then you, you park there with your a feeling idea. So your attention is maintained focused on that problematic notes because whatever will come in the notes you are not playing is not taking uh, your, your concentration away. Mm -hmm. And so one first point of the uh, highlighting technique in studying is kind of being casual in filling up. Uh, but maintaining the baseline rhythm so that you progress progressively enter with your entire body in the musical dynamic in terms of rhythmical flow and you are not disturbed initially by too many details. So again, a casual feeling here and there, but another approach when necessary is instead to perceive where the problems come when you start feeling and so decide to uh, repeatedly uh, remain with that feeling idea so that your attention is focusing on that particular problem before uh, moving ahead with additional additions of complications 
in what you are playing. At bar 37, the right hand is repeating the same texture that was dominant in the previous two pages. And instead, you have to work out a new harmonic texture at bar 38. So the usual process, like a first uh, you might consider to grouping in chords. So for a couple of times, and then keep adding. Even playing staccato with uh, weight drop uh, for a while again to, uh, to gain confidence on the keys that you have to, to press. But once again, these are simply intermediate steps uh, along our work, so mm, there is not a necessity to insist too much, I believe. And once we start kind of uh, getting clear what are those keys that we have to play, outlining to instead gradually enter into the musical material, but starting with the important pillars of the flow. And at part 38 and part 39, um, let's see a few details. So the crescendo, in particular at part 39, requires a gradual increase of energy in your chord here. And without losing it, that the thumb has to be the leading line. And uh, uh, I have the una corda down, I think most likely is a good idea with many instruments and environments. Uh, so, how to say, let's not be shy with our energy because it's necessary. There are many little notes here and there flying and uh, uh, to get this line coming up clearly, we have to put uh, some energy in that. The last thing, in this page, as I think it is quite often the case of Debussy, we have that slippery thing of uh, the jumps. Larger, smaller, but jumps from perhaps chord to single notes and typically in the we see on the black keys, so with a tiny area of landing, like here. I said that already in the previous sections where this became an issue in a few points. So um, I feel necessary to just restrict in that particular point a few notes before the jump, up to the jump a few times to, how to say, feel the distance and controlling uh, the jump and the landing. Um, for the rest, at bar 37, be aware that there is a near interference between hand. I remember the first time I was building the up, at a point I was feeling a bit uncomfortable, like uh, stepping over things. And in fact, on the second and third chords in the main line, you have the right hand that would take the same key that the left hand is holding, so left hand should go away on that key earlier than the arrival of the right hand. And the pedal will take care about sustaining the sound. And the same in the last semiquaver of the six notes in the right hand at the end of the second quarter. And the same thing happens in the second half of the bar. In addition, I have this 
long bit of line from the uh, last chord at part 38. So we have again this um, syncopated pedaling to, to familiarize with. So the long pedal line, I think, is a very good thing. I don't know if Debussy uh, marked it in his uh, manuscript, but I think it sounds very good. So we have this nice um, mixture of notes of harmonies. And um, just be aware about those three notes at the end of bar 39. That introduce the notes in bar 40 where Debussy marked accents, that accents, in the bass rhythm, but also in the detail rhythm here. So it is from bar 39. And then if your hand is similar to mine, I feel uncomfortable here to maintain the traditional good school pianistic configuration of the end with the finger naturally curved. I am hitting my cover, so uh, I found naturally convenient just to bend my fingers and uh, hold this funny position. The only thing I notice is that it becomes rather massive, right? Your arm and hand system in this way, you lose some flexibility. So it means that the control of the arm becomes very crucial and it has to play those accents in a piano context. But it's something I feel after a little bit of practicing comes natural. So once again a bit of outlining in these uh, measures and then we can keep going with a few more thoughts for the rest of the piece. exercise with the progressive feeling uh, is also a good thing to add the pedal and sometimes remove the pedal uh, because in either cases you have a different sound and action situation lighter action when the pedal is down because you are not lifting your numbers anymore instead heavier action when the pedal is, is up and either things are tricky in different ways. So um, uh, without pedal, we can better clearly see what we are doing with our fingers. And with pedal, we start refining our control of the aural expression of what we are doing. So measure 41. Uh, measure 41, we have the right hand that is playing something similar to what we did in the first page, right? So in the first page we had... Okay, basically the same thing uh, with the left hand that is playing a different pattern, a ternary rhythm. And notice the flat accents on the left hand. one only, they disappear at bar 42. So in a way this is the, the new thing
everything that happens here requires a bit of attention and of physical um, action. And here I feel that differently than in first page, I can play all the six semiquavers with the right hand. Um, I am kind of warmed up in this inconvenient one one step I think is more easily managed. However, our attention is not going there, but is going on the triplets here. first page of using the left hand to help out the right hand only in the second quarter where the right hand is going far in the acute section and there is this B to be taken. It is nearer to the left hand so Outlining uh, for me is the way to build up uh, these segments, but everything in this piece. Uh, let's go on, uh, bar 43. Notice an interesting detail. We have this profound, delicate bell here. The first time of their appearance, the Debussy Mark Pianissimo. The second time there is a piano, so we need to work a little bit more grip in our touch the second time, right? And filling up the details later when we have the bass rhythm established. Bar 44, don't miss to notice the indication slower until the end, right? Something that I forgot in my performance. So the see here wants to be, to be slower. Uh, there are no particular technical things except pay attention to the uh, dynamic sign, crescendo, diminuendo, the accent, things that we talked about at length until now. And so perhaps I feel uh, fun and effective uh, to establish the bass rhythm at first playing a kind of chord. games in dynamics by 45 the right hand has to do a crescendo and the left hand has to do a diminuendo so, uh... and we reach bar 47 uh, here I think uh, the left hand can conveniently help the right hand in taking the lower notes in the B chords. A little jump with the left hand. And a crossing, in my opinion, very comfortable to land on the D. You can take again the D with the right hand if you want to play with your arm rhythm and 
here on the very last part, the Debussy is not writing any corona, any crown on top of the last chord. So to me it means uh, he wants us to, to keep counting our, our beat. And for me it's another little sign of the evident rhythmical character of this work. And um, it's very fascinating for me this rhythmical uh, structure of the music with uh, slow tempo indication sounds like a paradox but I think it's really one of the magic things in this beautiful work. Thank you for listening to me until this point. Before really uh, concluding my, my thoughts, I want to uh, say at least once, um, plain and, and loud and clear, uh, one thing about what I think about this, my study discussions. I am basically presenting thoughts that belong to that part of working on the performing tasks uh, to express the music, the part of working that belongs to the realm of analysis and uh, technical practicing. So trying to understand uh, the problems technically here and there, what the signs mean on the score and where are they leading to? I know very well that this is something that is largely insufficient to uh, lead us then to the point of expressing uh, the magic of the music that it is somehow uh, offered to us through this course. Uh, so it's like we are working within a certain area of the work of the performer within a much wider and larger domain of expression. I don't even know what word to use for the rest. Uh, so this is, I would say, the humble part that belongs to using your mind and monitoring your feelings and uh, uh, it takes a lot of persistence in what you are doing and awareness. Uh, but once again, it's a limited domain of something much wider, much more mysterious. But for what I just said, I also believe that uh, it would be impossible, I think, uh, for me and perhaps for most of for everybody, just to create videos that pretend to cross that boundary of the analytical and uh, persistent and uh, accurate working to enter into the development of the other mysterious parts that belong, however, to the core of expressing music. And those parts, in fact, I think belong to spirituality rather than to technique. So mathematics is a very simple and clear uh, expression that is uh, a condition um, necessary and sufficient so that something else uh, becomes true. Right? When there is something that you notice, sometimes if you notice that something, you have what it needs and what it is sufficient so that something else that is less evident uh, becomes true at the same time. So with this analogy, what we are doing with these discussions is just to cover something necessary. Because I believe honestly that without doing all that uh, demanding work in terms of analysis, of trying, of exploring, uh, we never reach the point of expressing music through a performance in the keyboard. But it's just necessary, it's not sufficient. So I just wanted to, to say clearly, um, I know myself, this is just a part of the story. The rest is much more mysterious, but in a way even magic. And uh, what I feel, however, is with our humble steps that I try to describe or what I understand, we can kind of unlock a door and then get it open to continue with further steps in what really makes music magic. Uh, first of all, for us, that we are here doing all this work and perhaps at times 
uh, if we are blessed enough and lucky to share that with others. So again, thanks for following me until this point and I hope to see you again in my next uh, discussion.